And now, yeah, I want to introduce uh, Jay Goldstein. Um, he's a, uh, an NEM Industry Advisory Board member who has volunteered his time today to, to give our talk, so we're very appreciative of Jay. And Jay is a, a Calix School of Management alum and founder of Javik River, River Group, a Chicago-based agile training and coaching consultancy. As a practicing agile professional, Jay has held senior leadership positions in B2B and B2C tech companies in computer, commercial electronics, and cloud software. Certified by Scrum Alliance, the International Consortium of Agile, and Large Scale Scrum, or LESS, Jay has operated, consulted, and coached, coached, facilitated, and trained over 100 Fortune and early stage tech companies and entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. Jay serves as an adjunct faculty member in the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern University and teaches radical entrepreneurship. In 2015, Jay was appointed as a core team member for the Learning Consortium for the Creative Economy, where he facilitated peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, of their agile management activities for Microsoft, Mega International, Ericsson, C.H. Robinson, Riot Games, and several others. So with that, I introduce Jay Goldstein. Thanks, Steve, uh, for the chance to be here and share with you today um, on what I think is a, an amazing and exciting trend in, um, in management. And so I'm going to be taking a very high view of, um, of the subject um, and, uh, and look at it um, sort of from the top down. And that's why you see this diagram here. We'll take a look at traditional management and then how those five pillars of five planks of traditional management are different for Agile leadership. Um, thanks for the background, um, Steve. I won't have to go over anything else there except to say that it was about six years ago that I discovered this Agile movement. I'd been an entrepreneur, a uh, tech entrepreneur for many years. I'd been mentored on um, how, how to operate in, in many ways that are similar to, I, I later learned, uh, Agile principles, things like collaboration and working in iterations and customer centricity. But um, it wasn't until I was helping a friend scale a software company uh, that I was introduced to this huge body of knowledge that's now out there, knowledge and practice, that we're generally calling Agile. And what I found was that I didn't have to be, one doesn't have to be mentored as I was for so many years by um, entrepreneurs, by, by leaders, uh, innovators, but you, could, um, you can actually study, you can take courses, you can be trained, you can be coached, and fairly quickly come up into this whole new um, perspective of how to operate. Um, just a little list of some of the companies that are adopting uh, agile leadership. Of course, we know from the software realm, um, you know, folks like Quicken and, and Spotify, Microsoft, Yahoo, those kinds of folks. Um, but some folks are surprised to learn that this really applies to all domains. And so Saab is developing aircraft, uh, John Deere tractors, and um, BMW cars. And in the um, financial uh, space, we see a lot of movement with folks like Barclay that has made a worldwide initiative to transform and just a couple weeks ago, another one announced the largest uh, group in Australia, uh, ANZ, says they're going to uh, blow up their uh, bureaucracy, the CEO says, and make this shift to Agile. And uh, they want to be like, you know, the Google, Facebook, and Spotify's of the world. And um, that senior middle management jobs are at risk because, as we'll discuss, uh, the roles of a, a manager can substantially change. He makes the case for me when he says, it radically changes uh, the way you assign work, you fund work, you manage things, what you measure, how you reward, and again, what kind of capabilities that people need in order to succeed. So we're seeing quite a trend in uh, management. Finally, HBR um, came around and uh, about a year ago came, came out with a great article by Jeff Sutherland the uh, credited with being the inventor of the most popular methodology in agility, Scrum, and Hirotaka Takuchi, who um, came back to assist him in this article. He had written 
an article in, in the late 80s uh, where he described the Toyota method and the collaboration and how they move the, the work forward as a team. And he described it as a picture of rugby. And it was from that, that article, that idea, that Southern one, they actually got the concept of, of naming what he was doing, Scrum. Um, Steve mentioned the Learning Consortium. Uh, we published a paper on that. And I invite you to find that on my Javik River site. So let's go ahead and dive in and first take a look at traditional management. And if we had the ability to poll, I'd really like your feedback um, from those of you who have experienced traditional and agile management. And as I teach my, my course and my students have had internships and work in, in the field, it's, it's becoming more and more clear that they're in a traditional environment or they're in an agile type environment. Um, in a traditional management environment, we, I'm going to look at these characteristics, the goal, the role, the coordination, um, what's valued, and the way the communication happens. And we'll look at those same five things for agile leadership. Starting with the goal. In traditional management, we have this goal of maximizing shareholder wealth. That is underpins, for many years it's underpinned the, uh, the, the, the uh, philosophy and belief of traditional management. Going back to um, Friedman from the University South of here when he wrote The Social Responsibility of Business to Increase Profits. Um, that idea of increasing profits and shareholder wealth, it's not that it's a bad idea, it's just that it's a bad goal. And as Jack Welch points out, he says, it's a result and not a strategy. So it starts with this idea of shareholder wealth. And then we look at the role. What's the role of the uh, manager? What's the role of the, of the worker in a traditional uh, environment? And, uh, primarily, it's to execute on the plans uh, of the organization to essentially control. And I would go far as to say that control is even necessary because making money for shareholders is actually not a very inspiring goal in and of itself. And um, so to get conformity to that goal, we look to get um, some, some control around that. So how does the uh, coordination occur? Well, it's hierarchical bureaucracy. And if I were to ask you to go to the blackboard and draw a um, design of your organization, it would probably, if you're a traditional organization, it would look like this, right? It's a typical org chart, polygons stacked on top of other polygons. And this is the geometry of traditional management. We'll compare that with Agile. The values underlying it, the, sort of the philosophy, is, is a mechanistic view of the world. You know, this was Taylorism, this was scientific management. This is a world where people are not humans, but they're resources. Customers are targets. Um, you know, the focus is to cut costs, increase efficiency, and short-term financial goals are, are really what matter. I like um, Henry Ford's perfect characteristic of that era of management. He says, why is it every time I ask for a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached? That is not the era of the knowledge worker, right? That's not the world we live in today. And yet we live in a, a, and with remnants of this traditional management all around us. I would say that it comes from a, a belief uh, fundamentally in scarcity. And wait, um, you know, that there is a pie, and I just want my unfair share of it. I want to get as much of that of that as possible because that's all there is to go around. What Guy Kawasaki describes in Enchantment as being eaters. And the communication naturally is top down. It's by directive. It's typically one way. That's the overview of traditional management. And I think it's important to say, this is a little uh, clip from our learning consortium paper, that um, you know, we stand on the shoulders of the benefits today of hierarchical bureaucracy. And in fact, it was a great invention uh, over you know, feudalism and, and small shops and whatnot 
to be able to scale uh, the world of mass market products and services that we enjoy today. But as we know, the world's going through dramatic transition, right? With globalization, with the internet, the shift in the power to the buyer. And as a result, there are some substantial downsides to traditional management that we can take a look at. For one, it's expensive. Gary Hamill, the Wall Street Journal number one uh, business thought leader, says bureaucracy costs the U.S. economy $3 trillion a year. And that chart shows how the growth in managerial employment has outstripped other employment. Maybe we need to do something with all of those MBAs we're minting. Um, I was talking with a management consulting friend the other day, and um, he had forgotten that I helped get the uh, kiosk uh, developed for Redbox when that was first getting going. And he says, well, what I help my clients do is to not get Redboxed. And I said, Redbox? I've never heard it used as a verb before, but I, I like it as a result of having been involved with it. And what we find is um, traditional management is particularly undefended uh, against uh, disruption. And, and we redboxed a blockbuster, which is a story for another time. Uh, product life cycles have gotten very short, so you need to innovate much faster. Employees, highly disengaged. You can look at uh, Deloitte's Center for the Edge, one in five workers fully engaged. Um, Gallup estimates it costs uh, another half a trillion dollars a year about for employee disengagement. Um, and, uh, and they estimate about 15% of employees are actively disengaged, which means that while they're working for their company, they're actually sabotaging the company they're working for. And this is the kind of disengagement you can see. It's unsustainable. This is a uh, a chart on return on investments that fell 25%. Um, it's unsurvivable. The uh, uh, stock market, the life of a company in the stock market, moving from a 60-year average down to 12 years. And um, a number of folks have joined in the chorus of saying, this goal of shareholder wealth is really undermining um, our ability. Jack Welch even calling it the dumbest idea in the world. And... Um, Tribune reported a week ago that in 2016, 60% of CEO pay is now based on stock compensation. And so you see CEO pay, uh, which was, wasn't even uh, legal to do in the 80s, um, has grown substantially. So we have widespread systemic issues. That's a quick view of traditional management. Before I get to um, looking at agile leadership, I want to talk about what a shift we're talking about. Some would describe this as um, a Copernican revolution in management, and that we're, we're dealing with really a shift in the theory and practice of management that is so substantial it can be compared to, for example, you know, the Ptolemaic system, the old days when we thought that, that the uh, universe revolved around the Earth, and when Copernican came along, completely changed everything, right? Complete paradigm shift. Well, in the same way, you can imagine in the 20th century how much easier it was for the customer to revolve around the firm, right? You think about the Mad Men era, the ability to control information, to manipulate, um, you know, uh, production was, was limited. But today we have the power of the consumer. Uh, what our uh, distinguished alumni, Daniel Pink, describes as moving from Caveat, enter, let the buyer beware. To caveat, uh, vendetta, let the seller beware. And it's important to note, you can't do this part way. You know, we're not talking about tweaking or improving um, traditional management, like uh, Six Sigma and other types of improvements we've seen over the year that Jurgen Eppelow calls uh, management 2.0, the transition between traditional and um, agile. Um, one um, agile consulting leader, I asked him how he gets his clients. And he says that um, the first step is uh, he gets a call from an executive uh, at a company that's interested in agile transformation. And he says to them, um, no, you don't want to do that. And he hangs up on them. That's his start. And if they persist, and he has quite a few stages he will take them through, um, in their commitment, he will 
then work with them because it is such a complete and dramatic transition. So really moving from one sphere to another, and uh, it qualifies, I would say, for what you know, Thomas Kuhn described as a classic paradigm shift, what that Copernican revolution was. And he says, though the world does not change with the change of the paradigm, afterward we work in a different world. When we have a different mindset, when we have different eyes, we are working in a different world. It is a substantial shift, and it's not to be taken lightly. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. For one, and, and most importantly, the goal changes from maximizing shareholder value to delighting customers. It's not an entirely new idea. You know, the father of management, uh, um, Peter Drucker, says the only valid purpose of a firm is to create a customer. He said that in the 50s. But we're going beyond that to say not merely create, not merely satisfy, but today's goal is to delight. Delight as perceived and understood by the customer. They are the true north. They're the ultimate source of truth. And it is the only goal. And it's through that goal um, that we get these other benefits. What John, the economist John Kay calls the principle of obliquity. That um, there are certain things that you can't go for directly in life. For example, uh, maximizing shareholder value or happiness. That if you make those things your goal, you generally do not get them. They are byproducts. So making customer delight the primary goal, we get these other benefits from profit and quality and then satisfying all the stakeholders. And you say, well, how do you measure that? We know how to measure profit. How do we measure uh, shareholder delight? Well, there actually are some good ways. Um, one of the best, if you're not doing it, you need to be, that is, that promoter store, right? You've probably come out of a car dealer, you know, service center or somewhere, and you've gotten an email and it asked you this question, how likely are you to recommend this product or service to a friend or colleague? It's, it's a scale from minus 100 to plus 100. It's not an easy scale. Uh, to be on Google, the last time I checked, had an NPS of around 15. Um, last course I took, I... I I take surveys. I was very fortunate. I got up to about 68. Uh, Apple iPhone, um, over 70. So you see, it's a great measure. It's tough. It's very simple, though, to get one question. There are other means, but that's a good one. And this is why you see in the lean startup and the agile field why you, you have to create these hypotheses. You develop a, a representation of the product. You get it in front of people as soon as possible. You get feedback on that. And you have these iteration cycles because the client delight is a challenge to determine. So the role of the manager, the role of the employee, moves from controlling to empowering and to enabling. And more of um, to a coach. And I think um, Scrum and, and, and some agile practices have done a great service in in um, helping rebuild the middle management. Middle, middle managers who were controllers have uh, been you know, lost an inordinate amount of jobs, but folks that have come in to be these coaches, to be these servant leaders, um, have, have filled in a lot of those roles. And what are they um, empowering? What are they enabling? The secret sauce enabling self-organizing teams. And not only self-organizing teams, but cultivating high-performing self-organizing teams. Steve Dunning, and uh, much of this is based on his book, Radical Management, uh, he, he says, if you set up the conditions right, self-organizing teams will normally evolve into high-performing teams. So self-organizing teams can give your organization 30 to 60 percent more productivity, and many organizations think that's tremendous, and it is. But when you move into the realm of high-performing organizations, filled with high-performing teams, we are seeing 300 to 600 percent types of productivity gains. There are a number of characteristics to these kinds of teams. We won't go into all of them now, but um, they're cognitively diverse. Uh, they're cross-functional. They tend to be stable. It takes a long time to get to high-performing teams. Erickson um, said it's about 18 months. Uh, of, a, of a team performing together before they begin to typically achieve high performance. And 
that they're safe. Coordination, as already suggested by the teams, moves from um, hierarchical bureaucracy to coordination, uh, collaboration. So, and this is important because when you consider what kind of a problem we're dealing with, um, how is it, uh, what percentage, anybody have a guess, what percentage of consumer product goods are successful, according to the study in HBR? Now, here it is, you have the smartest Kellogg grads, you have the most knowledge about market research, and yet, what percent is successful? Any guesses? 5%. Very close. 3%. 3%. 97% failure on CPG new product launches. Why? It's because you're dealing with a wicked problem, they might, you may call it. Think of it like this. If this were everything you knew to be successful, in this, represented in a circle. I would suggest that the blue slice is what you know you know. It's the knowledge that you bring to it. The green slice is what you know you do not know. And you either learn that or you get an expert for it. And it's complicated, but it's not complex. It's knowable, it's a puzzle, uh, but um, the problems we're dealing with now, though, are in the rest of the realm. They're in mysteries. They're in unknown unknowns. And time and again, research and practice has shown that the way to discover um, how to solve for that, as Steve Denning says, a complex problem like, dis like delighting clients is best solved by a cognitively diverse group of people that's given the responsibility for solving the problem, self-organizes, and works together to solve it. And this is the learning organization. This is the key to uh, agile organizations. And the geometry is not polygons. I would suggest it's fractal. Uh, as Mandelbark uh, described, that self-similar patterns that we see in nature. And we see in successful companies now like Apple. Imagine they now have to, you know, jobs that even want to have outside developers initially. If they wanted a closed system. But we would not enjoy you know, the entire ecosystem we have today uh, of um, our mobile phones if they had not opened it up. And as of last year, there were about 13 million independent developers for Apple. Now, imagine if you had to use traditional management in that ecosystem. How long would it take, for example, um, annual reviews of 13 million people? It's just not possible, right? So it's a completely different way of organizing internally and with your external networks. The most um, common uh, implementation is Scrum. There are many others. Uh, it was popularized in 01. Um, the uh, Agility was actually named Agile at the, uh, this gathering in 01 where the Agile Manifesto was, was um, penned. Um, Scrum being the, the most, as I said, the most popular. Uh, we have enough data now that uh, you can see that when uh, projects, for example, are done with agility versus a conventional approach, they are three times more likely, uh, less likely to fail. And uh, have a completely different organization rather than top down. We have this balance of power that sort of was envisioned in our own um, United States government. And in Scrum, we have funny words for this. We call them a Scrum master or a product owner and the dev team. And so you have this, this co-equal approach. The values move from exploitative, the worldview of exploitative, to those of um, abundance. And we're moving from, again, the sort of view that, uh, that, that uh, Henry Ford had, um, thinking that the world is mechanistic, to understanding this complexity. And um, Guy Kawasaki calls those kinds of folks bakers, in other words, you know, we're not worried about getting the slice of the pie. We know that if we collaborate together, we solve uh, for client delight and these kinds of development business opportunities, we're going to make the pie bigger for everybody. And fundamentally, I'm not talking about practices like Scrum or some of these other things. The practices are the most malleable aspect of this. Foundationally, our values 
And I like to use the uh, five scrum values, for example, uh, focus, respect, openness, courage, um, courage, and commitment. And think about those as a mnemonic, like a frock, like a Jedi. So these agile uh, managers, these agile leaders, are cloaking themselves with the kind of emotional intelligence to be able to coach and empower others, fundamentally living out and exemplifying these values. Communication is not merely top-down, but it's rich. It's all directions, 360 degrees. When you visit, uh, especially organizations at scale that um, uh, are living in, in an agile culture, an agile environment, um, there's a buzz about them. They're, 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 there's communication happening um, all the time, conversations, and um, an opportunity to, so the developer division that Microsoft has about 4,500 folks now operating with agility. And they, um, they actually went through a couple of iterations of, of redesigning their entire um, infrastructure, their, their floor plans. They initially went to this open floor plan design that you know, was made popular in Japan where everybody's equal and, and the managers uh, sit among the workers. And although that's an improvement, it may eventually completely re uh, redesign from that because it found that um, in large open spaces there's what you call the library effect and that it inhibits conversations. So they moved to uh, these wonderful team rooms that they have. Every team room has an outside window and has a large enough space for the team to uh, work and meet together and then has about three different size rooms for different uh, combinations of people who want to make a call or you want to meet with two or three or uh, sit down in a side room. And, um, I, I, when the Learning Consortium uh, was visiting Microsoft, we, we were very skeptical with how Microsoft could not possibly be operating in this manner. And when we left the developer division, we were stunned. We were stunned at, at what they had developed there. And we were able to take a tour and, and, uh, and, and speak candidly uh, to some of the engineers. And I asked one engineer, I said, um, so, you know, what do you think of this transition that's been going on for four or five years at this point? And, he, and he'd been there through the whole time. And he said, he said, it's, pretty, it's been pretty tough. Um, and then we said, would you ever go back to the traditional any that you had? He says, no way. No way would I go back. So I left there thinking, this is an, an amazing place to work. Um, I would not have expected that. Then we went on to, uh, to all go down to Riot Games. That's, that's even more of an unbelievable work environment. If you're a gamer you need to, and an engineer, you need to go see Riot Games. And the Agile leaders um, learn social communication techniques. Um, we talk about gimbal walks. It kind of comes from that old idea of management by walking around, except it's, it's a, more, a little bit different philosophy. It's, it's just going where the work is happening, going where the action is, and observing and understanding, and communicating, or telling stories, um, engaging hearts and minds, influencing folks. Visual facilitation is huge. And when we visited uh, MAGA, one of the largest auto manufacturers, um, they took us through uh, the factory, and virtually every wall has uh, charts and, and graphs and visual facilitators on it. And everyone can see at every time what's happening. And you can meet in front of those ad, ad hoc if you need to and deal with any production or quality issues. Um, you see this um, in Scrum, they call, they, we call these information radiators and, and uh, like to keep all of the work visible at all the time. So these are some of the ways to keep communication moving. And that's a quick overview of both systems. So at this point, we have time to open it up for some discussion, for some questions. What have you been finding, Steve? He was going to ask a um, So does agile leadership mean that it's completely a flat organization with no hierarchy? Does it mean that it's completely flat? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So there's the uh, email, and there is the... Uh, Hashtag. 
So, um, so that's often um, that's often confused. You know, are we doing uh, with absolutely no hierarchy at all? Um, and um, I would go back again to I think the way Microsoft described it, and they they use two uh, di dimensions. They use a dimension of um, alignment and uh, autonomy. And in the alignment. That is the environment that um, that they're fostering. That everybody's going to share. It. So they make decisions like every. There, they decided everybody is on the same pace. So all iterations are three weeks, and they all end at the same time. Um, they come to agreement on what they call the taxonomy, which is the language that they use together. So when they use words like collaboration and iteration, or for different words, or a stand up or words about the way they operate together, they actually agree and they know what those words mean. They, they've had alignment. Um, and Aaron Bjorko has been the instigator you know, uh, for this uh, um, agile transformation. He, um, he shared, he says, he says, very often, almost all of our conversations are between alignment and autonomy. Right? So we're defining a boundary. So, um, they uh, rely on Daniel Pink's uh, drive, and when they talk about autonomy, they're talking about what, what Pink talks about when he talks about um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And, and so that's, that's also part of their, their language there. So what does the organization um, sort of contain or um, agree to uh, for everyone, and then what freedom and autonomy do the teams have? There, they've moved to... Um, a feature orientation, so they have feature groups, feature teams. They own those features. They interact directly with the users of those features. They get feedback on, you know, the priority of, of development for the next uh, features. And so, um, so there's a lot of autonomy. So, um, you know, other places you see things like uh, holacracy. I don't know if anybody's heard that phrase. It's another very, very detailed methodology. That's one of those famous. Very famous examples, and um, and there um, there you get a much more detail. Uh, it's always like a several hundred pages, like legal document of of how this autonomy is going to operate. Uh, hi highly uh, uh, described. So I think you see these different dynamics in, in different places. Jay, I have a question. Um, you know, MEM is kind of this blend of, of business and engineering, right. and, and we incorporate a lot of, uh, of the topics you're discussing today in our curriculum, but we're, like, overall our business schools kind of on the, on the topic of Agile and teaching it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think they're behind. Um, you know, all the training I did, I had to go to independent organizations. Basically, after my MBA, when I discovered Agile, I, I went back to school, um, with the eight or so certifications I got. Uh, Steve Denning, um, and I would tend to agree with him, he thinks the business schools are probably still five years back on this. But think about the origins, for example, of the MBA. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Masters of Business Administration, right? I mean, it was designed in the 40s and 50s to perfect scientific management. So all of what we have learned how to do is so much entrenched in this view of the world. And um, I'm hoping that the business schools get a second track going. I would call a Masters of Business Agility. <laughs> and uh, um, I see this, um, for example, in the continuing education um, at some of the universities where they have two tracks of so the traditional and, a, and an agile. So, uh, it remains to be seen, you know, how long it's going to take. Great. And, and we, we have a question online, so I'm going to try to paraphrase it for you. Okay. It says, uh, over, thank you overall. This comes from a great informative discussion today. Um, but the question relates to this, how does a tiebreaker happen in the agile environment? You know, with traditional management, a manager can make the call on what direction to go when needed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, does this still exist in the same capacity right. in agile, or is, is there, you know, uh, do you have to get everyone to agree to go in a certain direction? Yeah, so, so, um, so if you recall, I was trying to pull it up here. If you recall the triangle uh, design of the organization, 
Um, and, and I deal a lot, a lot of it, I deal with this often with the, in my um, entrepreneurship course, because the students come in, the most teamed, you know, uh, group in, in, in the history of, you know, them working on group projects since middle school or earlier. And, um, and yet their method of, of, of um, you know, decision making is consensus. And it's actually pretty ineffective. Um, and so in, in agility, um, it's recommended to have roles and a, uh, and a, you know, some people even say a single throat to choke. Like some would say that, for example, a project, a traditional project manager is in the worst position, right? So that they, if, if they succeed, the, um, the, the management above them takes the credit, and if they fail, they take the blame, and they have little power in many cases to actually change what's going on. Um, that role shifts, in, for example, in Scrum, where you've got a product owner or a Scrum master. And those Scrum master wears the hat of the process. How are, how are we doing? What impediments are in the way? How can I empower the team? How can I move, remove those impediments? Where the product owner actually owns the value of the work being done. So they're setting the priority of, uh, of the order of things that, that get done. They can do it with a lot of input. But they are, they're given the role to do that. And you can move on up the organization, and you see these same dynamics um, where, some, where the, the, the team will, um, will provide the role, will create the role. At Ericsson, um, they're not assigned uh, scrum masters. They actually decide among them who's going to take a break, in their case, from, from programming development for a couple of years and work on some other skills and uh, become their scrum master for their team. So they rotate scrum masters slowly, but it, it's up to them to, to have that role. So, um, so is that, does that help? Yeah, no, I think it helps a lot. Thank you. Uh, so right now, like today, the trend is everyone wants to be agile and every industry wants to be. So are there any industries which are blocked by their product complexity or the way they work that they are still sticking to the traditional yeah. management and do not go for the agile one? Uh, where they're sticking to it? Yeah. Uh, no, I wouldn't say um, it's failed to apply anywhere. But um, I think where some of the confusions come is because the rise in and the you know, agile, agile came out originally came out of um, even hardware development and you know the toiling away and away things like that, um, and it, it was not intended merely to be software development. But when the software folks got their hands on it, that's what really popularized it, right? And so what happens often is that is the the coaches or the uh, trainers or the experts that are trying to help other business um, functions only have a reference point of software. And so, um, um, so, so it's, you need to find the, the, the right domain expertise. And, uh, but you can see uh, interesting things happening in hardware um, where the constraints are totally different. But there's still benefit to moving to more modularity, to moving to more iterations. Um, there's a great story by Joe Justice, if you look it up on, um, on Yahoo, where they did a uh, a car design, a 100 mile power car design to compete for this X Prize, and uh, they did it through agility, and they were um, revising the car every week. So, so because they they designed it from the start to be modular, and you see some of this with the Tesla, which you know the drivetrain has 20 moving parts instead of, um, but but the, the constraints are, are are very you know it, it's uh, in jets and and in regulatory environments. They vary, and so it it can look a lot different. Um, that's why I like to emphasize the values, because when you're you're instilling those values, you're, you're instilling that that team-based collaboration. They can work to solve for those um, those impediments that are the nature in those particular environments. Um, some interesting things have happened in other disciplines like marketing uh, or sales, uh, for example. Um, you know, sales is typically uh, compensated by commission and individual compensation. But some companies, there's a case study, Geodetic, uh, a web uh, developer out in Cedar Rapids that started in the software department and decided, hey, this is great, we're going to do this in every uh, function. <clears throat> and 
the sales department went from an uh, individual-based compensation to a team-based compensation, compensation. And all of a sudden, a number of unexpected benefits began to occur. Um, for example, one of the salespeople, they had long sales cycles with large hospital groups, and uh, um, it was primarily being run by one particular salesperson, a prospect, but um, they had their daily stand-ups, and the team talked about all of the activity going on all the time. This particular uh, employee went out on paternity leave, and wouldn't you know it, after I had six, eight months or something, the hospital calls and says, um, now we're ready to get going. And he's not available. Another member of the team, two other members of the team, show up. They've never met before. They're astounded to see they know everything that's happening. So you have this redundancy, right? And they, um, they close the deal. And the guy comes back from the training league. They're happy. You know, the team's happy. You see other dynamics uh, where they teamed up between a more experienced person who had a lot of contacts with a less experienced and needed, they needed help together. And, and so, um, but it's experimental. They actually had to go through a number of rounds of figuring out how does this apply to a completely different domain. But the results are pretty exciting. What else we have? Um, so is Scrum the most popular approach? Um, is Scrum the most popular? Yeah, uh, Scrum has become the most popular. Um, Scrum Alliance, which is one of the certifying groups, is now certifying about 10,000 people a month. I think they're up over a million worldwide. Um, and uh, there's others that certify. And it, no one's really researched why this is the case. I have my theory. My theory is that, um, is that Scrum, and I've implemented a lot of teams with Scrum, um, it gives you the least amount you need to get going. You know, as opposed to, for, for example, holacracy, very difficult. Um, at the other extreme. But Scrum is, is when, when these, all of these uh, practitioners got together at the, the 17 of them that signed the Agile Manifesto in uh, Utah in a one, they called their methods, other methods they called them lightweight uh, management methods, lightweight project management methods. And Scrum is one of the most lightweight. And so what it does, I can describe it in eight minutes. I mean, what it does is it allows a team to get started. And if you can get started quickly, and you can get going, one of the, they call it ceremonies, one of the meetings, is a retrospective. If you can get the team started and self-improving, it almost doesn't matter where you start from, because you'll get that continuous improvement over every iteration. And so I'm not too much of a stickler um, for you know, how perfectly a team implements Scrum initially, as long as they're getting enough benefit from the basics of it that they can get going. Uh, because it, it can take time, you know, like I mentioned, for, for teams to uh, become high-performing teams. But getting them started is the key. And it took, um, it took examples quite a while to get going on holacracy. You might remember um, when they made the transition, they also, um, they also asked for volunteers if anybody wasn't happy with this change. And uh, I think I lost about 16% of their workforce who decided it wasn't for them, which I think is a good result, you know, um, that people have a clear enough understanding of the difference. But it took them a couple of years compared to uh, other folks who get going as from, I would say, quicker. Well, Jay, I think this has been great. And we, we had a one last comment in from someone online who said, um, this has been great. I, I, I was a software developer that has moved into a project management role, and I, I see our company now trying to implement what you're discussing, and this has just been very informative. So on that note, thank you so much for okay, our talk.